Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to worship today on the 12th Sunday after Pentecost. And welcome back to some folks who've been traveling this summer. Uh, as people start to come back from their vacations, it's great to see the place space fill up again with your shining faces and welcome to those of you gathered online as well for this celebration as we begin our journey into god's presence this morning i invite you to reflect back on your week those conversations and actions that we wish we could take back and start over this morning uh, with a clean slate and clean hearts to do that we rise and face the baptismal font where we were claimed as god's children and confess our sin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Holy God, we confess that we have not been obedient to your will for us. We have sought justice for ourselves, but neglected justice for others. We have insisted on our rights, but have not lived rightly in our relationships. We have desired mercy for our sins, but we have not offered mercy to those who have sinned against us. Help us to love as you have loved us, that our lives may testify to your abounding grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Beloved, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Receive the gift that is yours by faith. You are forgiven from all your sins. Live in peace, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. First reading is from Messiah. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane. And hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcast of Israel, I will gather others to themselves. Thanks. Uh, the word, word of the Lord. Second reading is from Romans. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all his disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. 
Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated and I invite the children to come join me up front for a little bit. Good morning. It's so good to see some of you back today. That reading we just heard is probably my least favorite reading in all of the New Testament. Do you have any idea why? Was there anything in that reading that surprised you, didn't seem quite right? So this woman came to Jesus because her daughter was sick. And how, did, how did Jesus first respond to her? Did you notice? He didn't seem too eager to, to step right in like he usually does. Maybe he was tired or he was frustrated. But then something else happened. What did he, what word did he use when he was describing her? He said, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. <coughs> not very nice. Now, I don't want to excuse what he said, but I want to try to explain what might have been happening. So Jesus was a Jew, right? And so all of his family, all of his life, he believed at first that his mission was to be with, to serve his own people. Just like people today put themselves in groups, you know, and they sort of can fall into that trap of thinking that they only need to associate with people that are just like them, that look like them, or come from the same place as them, or background as them. He might have been in that place that morning. And basically was saying, you know, I'm sorry that you're hurting, but my job is to minister to my own people. But did she take that for an answer? <laughs> she did not. This was a persistent, courageous lady, and she said, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And with that, it was like it woke Jesus up. The light went on in his head. He said, this woman, she may not be part of my family, my tribe, but actually this woman has faith greater than a lot of the people I already know. And she said, let it be done to you. And her daughter was healed instantly. Sometimes we don't always get it right the first time. You know, that's okay. We all make mistakes, and we all have days when we're not at our best. But that isn't what makes us a good person. The beauty of this story is that when that woman spoke up and spoke her truth, when she was persistent, that changed the situation, and Jesus changed his mind. And he realized, actually, God is calling me to something bigger than what I thought, bigger than just my own tribe, my own people, God is present in this woman, and God is present in all people. And from that point forward, Jesus' ministry was open to everyone. So it's because of her faith in speaking out that she was able to change the situation, but also it helped Jesus see that his call was for everyone. And that was a changing moment probably in his life. And so we don't remember him for the the bad thing he said at first, but for 
this moment when his heart was opened and his mind was opened and he realized that when God called him, it was not this sort of narrow call just to certain folks, but to the whole world. And we give gratitude to God for that and for this woman for speaking her truth. So let us pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you that your mission, your love is for all people. And we thank you for those people in our lives who remind us of that when we're not always at our best. We thank you for this woman and her daughter and for Jesus and for his ministry which touches each and every one of us. Forgive us for the times when we forget that and when we make your love too narrow. Help us always to welcome everyone, friend and stranger, as your beloved child. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 1968, a man named Walt Reiner, a theology professor at my hometown of Valparaiso, Indiana, was on a three-year leave of absence from teaching while he was directing a program called Prince of Peace Volunteers in Chicago. And while he was working at this program, he met a woman named Barbara Cotton, church secretary and mother of six. And she was living at that time in the notoriously dangerous and now demolished Cabrini Green Public Housing Project. And over the years, she became very involved with the volunteer program and earned Dr. Reiner's trust, such that when his time in Chicago was winding down, she offered him a challenge. She said, I'd like to move to a nice little town like Valparaiso where my kids would be safe, too. Now, Mrs. Cotton and her six children were black. And in 1968, there were exactly zero black people living in Valparaiso, Indiana. She knew this, as well as the city's history of racism. The university where Dr. Reiner taught, also my alma mater, was purchased at the last minute by the Lutheran Church in order to save it to prevent it from being sold to none other than the Ku Klux Klan, which had a stronghold in the area at the time. Knowing all this and the pushback she would inevitably receive, as well as the pushback that he would inevitably receive, Dr. Reiner told Mrs. Cotton in not so many words that she was crazy. It's not that she wasn't a lovely person, but as I remember people saying, even when I was growing up, her kind just didn't live in Valparaiso. But Mrs. Cotton did not believe that she was crazy, and she was determined even after Dr. Reiner relented and gathered together some other faculty and local Lutheran pastors to help, they failed in several attempts to buy or even rent a home for the Cotton family. So they built her a house on donated property right next to the house where he lived. And they called their new organization Project Neighbors. They would go on to renovate dozens of rundown homes in the town and with volunteer labor and make them available to families wishing to move. To no one's surprise, there were editorials in the local paper accusing Reiner and his organization and the churches that were part of it as destroying our town. Our town, because in their mind, it belonged to people like them. But there were also those whose hearts and minds were changed as they lived and worked and played and worshipped alongside their new neighbors and realized that they were actually the same kind of human, children of God. 
it's very easy to judge someone based on their first reaction to something new, something that is outside their experience or comfort zone or long-held system of belief. Twitter, or X as it's now apparently called, has made a business model out of this, dragging out various clips of leaders and celebrities saying things 10, 20, 30 years ago as if to prove that because something they once believed, or at least said in a moment of frustration, that they are an incurable bigot or hypocrite who must disappear from the public realm. I have no doubt that if there was Twitter in 1968, we would remember Dr. Reiner not for the organization he founded, but for that initial soundbite when he told Mrs. Cotton she might be crazy. And I'm even more certain that if there was Twitter in Jesus' day, this episode in our gospel today, where he likens a foreign woman to a dog, would be breaking the entire internet. It feeds into every trope that still plagues religious leaders, sometimes rightfully so, that they're hypocrites, that they only care about people in their own group, that they are judgmental and exclusive. And there's no denying that this woman was not in Jesus' group. She was a Gentile, not a Jew, and therefore not one of those lost sheep from the house of Israel that Jesus believed God had sent him to minister to. Now before we go any farther, there are two very important things that need to be said here. One is that it is never okay to call a person a dog. Not then, not now, not ever. We have a word in English that means about the same thing, and it's not something I would ever want to hear coming out of my pastor's mouth. And the other is that we don't need to pretend like it was okay, or that it was some kind of test of the woman's faith in order to maintain this image of a Jesus who is not really human in the same ways that we are, someone who gets tired and frustrated, someone who feels like their ability to give and give and give is at capacity, someone who was born into and raised in a culture that had actual prejudices and biases. If Jesus did not have any of that, if he was sort of beamed down from heaven, completely insulated from the human experience, then he would not be one of us. And our humanity would not be redeemed. The real test of a person's character is not how they react in the moment, even if it happens to be their worst moment. At least not if the end game is something bigger than just public shaming or a need to showcase one's own self-righteousness. The test is whether someone has the humility and courage to be open to something new. New information, new experiences, new people that challenge the ideas that they have always believed to be true. There's no doubt that Jesus' initial understanding of himself and of his mission in the world was focused on his own people. He was a faithful Jew from an observant Jewish family. He had been circumcised and named according to Jewish tradition, presented in the temple after 40 days, and raised with the understanding that his people were God's covenant people, chosen and unique among the nations. And that was by no means a uniquely Jewish concept, right? The whole world was very tribal then. People stuck to their own group and were suspicious of others and we're certainly not above calling each other names. But like Mrs. Cotton, this woman with a sick daughter was not having it. It's as if she knew that Jesus was called to something greater, that the good news people were experiencing in him and through him was wider, more universal than the confines of his old way of thinking. Have you ever had someone like that in your life? Someone who brought you to a deeper understanding of who you are, of your purpose in life, of your relationship to other people, even to God? Those people are turning points in our lives where we can point and say, I 
was a different person before I met so-and-so. But because of them, I am a better person, a better parent, a better citizen, a better spouse or friend today. This unnamed Canaanite woman was such a person for Jesus, precisely because she pushed him. First off, she addresses him as son of David, which is a very Jewish identification coming from a Gentile. It'd be like an atheist referring to the Pope as Holy Father. I can only imagine that made Jesus raise his eyebrows. And then without missing a beat, she responds to him calling her a dog with, well, <laughs> even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. And in that moment, he sees her with new eyes. He does not dig in his heels and say, lady, I already said no. <laughs> he doesn't backpedal with some lame, that's just how guys talk around here, I was only joking. He doesn't turn the focus on himself and say, but what about my feelings? He makes a complete, unequivocal, and public reversal. He praises her faith out loud. He receives her as one of his own, and with her, the entire Gentile world. That would be us. He makes Isaiah's words in our first reading today his own personal motto, saying just a few chapters later, My father's house shall be a house of prayer for all people. And this, beloved, is the trajectory of the entire gospel. We got a hint of it at Jesus' birth as those three kings or astrologers from foreign lands came to pay him homage with their gifts, signifying that this child belonged to the whole world. And from then, it has always been about widening the circle. It is always about crossing imaginary boundaries and barriers, bringing in the very people who have been told they do not belong. As Robert Brown Taylor puts it, it's about Jesus' arms stretching open in an embrace until they are nailed open. And that is said to be the ultimate and final revelation of God's heart, the desire that everyone be saved. And we know that this universality, this love that knows no boundary or distinction, was the very reason some people turned on Jesus. If your concept of salvation is being surrounded in heaven with people who look and think exactly like you, then someone like Jesus very much is, well, destroying the neighborhood. <laughs> but if you, like the woman in our story, are just trying to get your daughter healed, if you, like Mrs. Cotton, are just trying to raise your kids someplace where they can be safe, well, then salvation looks like someone who was not too proud to change his mind, to take the risk of looking crazy in the eyes of his neighbors, of his own people, in order to do the right thing. You could even call it a miracle. It's something as holy as anything you'll find in the Holy Scriptures. It's a story to tell again and again and shout from the rooftops in our own day and age that Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, did not equate arrogance with godliness, did not hang on to his prejudices like a coward, did not hide behind weapons or shields or spin, but allowed his heart to be open. That is the work of a savior. Having all the power and esteem the world can offer, being in the form of God, but choosing not to cling to that power, but to empty himself, to lay it down, to let it go, so that those who are used to living on scraps can live. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, when his body becomes part of our bodies, then all the people he brings to the table with him become our family too. Jew and Gentile, woman or man, gay or straight, native or foreigner. If Jesus is our Lord, then his people are our people. And there are no kind of people that are not his people. In that sense, every time we gather around this table, we're doing a kind of dress rehearsal for heaven, eating from one loaf, becoming one body, where every division is washed away, and we get a glimpse of how things are supposed to be. And that's my prayer for all of us, that we go from this place 
opened as healers, as reconcilers, following in the way of our Savior Jesus, who himself was opened even unto death for us, that none may go home with the crumbs, with what's left, but with the full measure of his love. In that love, he has restored our humanity. In that love, he has already made us one. Let us, like him, begin to live into it. Amen. Church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. The third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our prayers today, we remember those living in the southern United States in the path of Hurricane Harriet or something. What? Hillary. 
Um, looks like it's going to be a, a, a lot of flooding down there, so we hold them in our prayers. Are there any prayers, joys, or concerns from the community that we should add to those this morning? Not, what's that? Oh, in Hawaii, yes, the recovery efforts in Maui, just devastating from those fires. Yes, Ruth? Uh, the storm on the west coast, going up the west coast. Storm on the west coast as well. The weather has just been really awful the last couple of weeks. And certainly God knows the, 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 the desires and the secret of our hearts that we bring this morning as well. Confident that God receives our joys and concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. For the church, that we may be instruments of God's mercy, guides for all who are seeking God, and companions to those developing a relationship with God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who have helped to strengthen our faith, for parents, teachers, and those who give witness by their fidelity of their life, that they may continue to be examples of Christian discipleship to all who encounter them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For an end to racism and prejudice, that God will turn hearts and change minds so that everyone may be respected and their dignity affirmed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For refugees and immigrants, particularly those fleeing violence, that God will ease their suffering, guide them to safety, and stir the hearts of many to assist them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are sick, that God's healing love will strengthen them, remove their pain, and restore them to wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For students, particularly those who will be away from home for the first time, that God will help them learn, stay safe, and find the resources they need to assist them in the coming months. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who now rest from their labors, that God would motivate us by their lives of dedication to the gospel until that day when we will join them in our eternal home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us share with each other a sign of God's peace. And you may be seated.
us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand in blessing. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need, through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come, come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Send your Holy Spirit, our advocate, to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup the body and blood of Christ, with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age, that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, O oh God, now and forever. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive what you are, the body of Christ. May we become what we receive. The ushers will guide you forward around the table for Holy Communion. All are welcome here.
God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Welcome once again to worship this morning. It is our joy to be together on this Lord's Day. You are invited across the hall for snacks and fellowship. Um, a couple of um, brief announcements. Next Sunday is uh, Summer Choir, so if you want to join at what, 9.30? 9.30. 9.30 a, a, a simple anthem and the psalm. Uh, also, um, on the 24th is uh, the Adult Vacation Bible School. If Barbara was here, she would remind us of when we were children and, and got to go to VBS and, and hear stories and snacks. And, and there's an adult version of this the ELCA has come out with. So you are very invited to come to that at 6.30 on the 24th. There's a sign-up sheet out in the narthex. And are there any other announcements from the congregation this week? Diane. Yes. I Yes, his service is tomorrow at one o'clock at Parker. I'll be doing that. I'm sorry I didn't announce that during the prayers. Yes, he hasn't been around here in some time, but when I would visit him, he was very <laughs> grateful for knowing that he's part of this community. Uh, Simon, you had an announcement as yeah, well. I just
Thank you. Be on the lookout for that. That's going to be in, in late September, uh, we think. So, so you're all welcome to that. Any other announcements this morning? Seeing none. Our worship has ended. Our service in the world begins. Go now and glorify the Lord with your life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.